Buenas then half a day members and guests. Welcome to the Guam Chamber's Congressional Forum. We are pleased to see so many of our island residents joining us this morning. It is our hope that today's session will provide an opportunity for each candidate to address concerns about our economy and lend their perspectives on various private sector issues. I would like to thank each of our candidates for spending time with us today. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on issues that are important to our business members and our community as a whole. Without further delay, I would like to turn this over to our Guam Chamber President, Ms. Catherine Castro, who will go over the format for today's presentation. Sizu Smalasi. Half a day, and thank you for joining us. As Chairwoman Baletu mentioned, today's Congressional Candidates Forum is to provide the membership and business community with an opportunity to meet and learn the views of the Congressional candidates before the elections. The order that the candidates answer questions were predetermined by lottery just before the start of today's forum. As candidates are introduced by our moderator, they will be given five minutes to address the audience. During the question and answer section, each candidate will be asked a question and will be given two minutes to provide a response. A timekeeper will provide prompts for each candidate to keep the allotted time. The chamber membership has prepared several questions ahead of time, which will be used for today's forum. All participants are on mute during today's virtual event. Thank you again for being with us this morning. I would like to now turn the platform over to our moderator, Chamber Board Director, Ernie Galito. Hafa day, Toto Hamzu. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to the Guam Chamber of Commerce Congressional Forum. This forum is conducted online through Go go to seminar, uh, webinar for the convenience and safety of our invited guests, directors and staff of the Guam Chamber of Commerce, our membership, the general public, and the local media. On November 3rd, 2020, it will be a, a, an historic occasion in the history of our country. Millions of citizens will cast their votes to elect the country's next president and vice president, 35 members of the U.S. Senate, and 435 seats in the 117th U.S. House of Representatives. Also, it will be election day for six delegates to Congress from the Insular Territories and the District of Columbia. Today, we have the privilege to hear about the issues on Guam we feel are important to the economy and the well-being of Guam, our community, our region, and our country from three congressional delegates, uh, candidates running for office. This morning, each candidate will have the opportunity to deliver their best two minutes to express their views on each of today's posed questions. So to begin our forum, I will ask each candidate to give his opening remarks after I give a brief introduction, and we will then follow with a series of questions to hear their responses. So I'm putting up uh, Congress Congressman Michael F. Q. San Nicholas. And here is his introduction. Michael F. Q. San Nicholas is Guam's delegate to the House of Representatives in the 116th U.S. Congress. In this, his first term, Congressman San Nicholas has worked to secure funding for the payment of war claims according to the Guam. World War II Loyalty Recognition Act. He also worked to extend coverage to Social Security Supplemental Security Income to the Territory of Guam, secure reimbursement of the Earned Income Tax Credit for FAS migrants residing in Guam, and address herbicide-exposed veterans who served in Guam, among other issues. San Nicholas currently serves as Vice President of the House Committee on Financial Services and its subcommittees, the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy. San Nicholas also serves on the Committee on Human, I'm sorry, on Natural Resources 
and its subcommittees on Indigenous Peoples of the United States and the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Congressman San Nicolas is a member of the Congressional Asia Pacific American Caucus, the Congressional Historic Caucus, the Congressional Caucus on Korea, the Congressional Taiwan Caucus, the Future Forum Caucus for US and Japan Caucus, and the Congressional U.S.-Philippines Friendship Caucus. As he is no stranger to civic service, Congressman San Nicholas comes from a long line of public service. His grandfather, Senator Franklin Kitigua, served as Speaker of the 19th Guam Legislature, and his great-grandfather, Ignacio Kitigua, was a senator during the 1st and 9th Guam legislatures. From 2013 to 2019, San Nicholas served as a senator in the, third, 20, in the 32nd, 33rd, and 34th Guam legislatures. He graduated from Southern High and received a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Guam in 2004. Members and guests, I am pleased to welcome our congressional candidate, Congressman Michael F.Q. San Nicholas. Half a day, Ernie, half a day, President Castro, and half a day, uh, Chairwoman Baletto, the, the members of the Guam Chamber, uh, members of our business community present, uh, my fellow candidates for Congress, and of course, the people of Guam. You elected me as your congressman in 2018, and in our first term, we have accomplished and set into tangible motion an unprecedented amount of progress. We have tackled key long-standing issues that have spanned years, if not decades. With the passage of H.R. 1365 of March, in March of 2020, we have closed the outstanding war claim saga and have to date paid out 1,974 claimants with a process tracking to close all adjudications by the end of this year. I just concluded a call of the U.S. Treasury today, ensuring that there are no processing setbacks once claims are finally adjudicated by the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission. We have secured forgiveness of all fiscal year 2019 Medicaid matching requirements saving the people of Guam approximately $20 million in 2019. And with the passage of H.R. 1865 into law, we have brought our federal matching in Medicaid from 55% to 84%, and our cap in Medicaid from 18 million to $127 million, saving tens of millions of dollars in matching funds and enabling the program to help thousands more of our people. We have secured a firm commitment from the House to reimburse 75% of our earned income tax credit liabilities, approximately $40 million a year, with the language for that reimbursement included in HR 3300, HR 3307, HR 5687, HR 6379, and HR 6800, with two of these measures passing the House with our language intact. We have unanimous bipartisan support for our amendment 331 to the current National Defense Authorization Act, H.R. 6395, to extend our H-2B visa exemptions for civilian projects outside of the fence, which will boost our stalled construction industry and put more housing inventory in play that can help make rents and home ownership more affordable. In the past six months, working with our fellow territorial colleagues, and in particular, leveraging the new weight Guam has on the Exclusive Financial Services Committee, wherein Guam was unanimously selected by her peers to serve as vice chair, we have brought in unprecedented relief for our island and people. In the form of stimulus payments and UOG and GCC tuition reimbursements and fully federally funded unemployment benefits, we have put over $1 billion directly into the pockets of our people rescuing the livelihoods of over 36,000 of our people and their families. We have kept over 3,500 businesses from closing their doors with over $275 million in forgivable PPP and EIDL loans, which further ensured that up to 32,000 private sector jobs had direct support. In addition to the 200 million in tax revenues these have generated, we have secured 117 million in relief direct to the government of Guam, and an additional 85 million in aggregate to health, education, and public safety. The whole island of Guam, 
from households to businesses to the government of Guam has been kept afloat with 1.6 billion in relief and counting. An exponential difference from the mere 6 million we received during the 1995 Asian economic crisis, the 1998 bursting of the dot-com bubble, the 2000, the year 2000 provisions for Y2K, and the 2001 attack on the Twin Towers combined. Not only have we secured an unprecedented level of support for our island, we have also engaged in an unprecedented level of local advocacy. To put it plainly, your congressional office speaks up for the people of Guam. We have sent a dozen engagement letters to the Guam legislature, the governor, Kam Navmar, and our private sector on various subjects that directly benefit our people, including sharing solutions to pay remaining work claimants without the need for time-consuming federal legislation, research our office has done to enable essential workers to be paid using programs adopted by the state of Pennsylvania, research we have also done to access all government CARES Act funds for rental assistance. So we are not limiting ourselves to those related to HUD grants. We have even sent a letter almost a year ago that would have started the process to have our Guam Museum become an affiliate museum of the Smithsonian. We speak up for these issues because we need to have all options on the table for our people to recover as quickly as we can and for our local foundation to be situated for the work we have ahead. With Guam currently reliant on federal spending and tourism, we have ensured that up to $990 million in military build-up fund funding was authorized during our term. We have introduced H.R. 7986 to create a process for eligible Guam contractors to classify as native corporations, similar to their Alaska and Hawaiian counterparts we have seen on Guam, an option we have had since 1988, opening up greater access to up to $30 billion in federal contracting under the 8A program. We have introduced HR 8028029 to study our heritage areas on Guam and get funding for our historic and cultural sites, an option we have had since 1994 that would bring in millions in new federal dollars and funding site improvements to our visitor industry. We have done all of this in one year and nine months in office. It has been the honor of a lifetime to work and deliver for you. We wish to continue this level of service for you and we'll do so if you will so have us. Thank you and see you as Thank you, Congressman San Nicholas. Next, I'd like to introduce our second congressional candidate. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll introduce Senator William Castro. And William Castro serves currently as Senator in the 35th Guam Legislature. He is chairman on the Subcommittee on Charter, Independent and Home Schools, Public Libraries and Technology Centers, and is the Vice Chairman on the Committee on Education. Senator Castro has experience in both the public and private sectors, working as the Director of Bureau of Statistics and Plans and as the senior staff during the Cal Tenorio administration. He's also a small business owner providing services in e-commerce, technology, and planning. Senator Castro holds a master's degree from Harvard University with additional graduate credits from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he has attained doctoral candidacy status at Columbia University. He is a member of the Young Men's League of Guam, the Knights of Columbus, and is active in the Barragata Neighborhood Watch Program. Members and guests, I am pleased to welcome our congressional candidate, Senator Will Castro. Afedei Todo Santo, thank you, uh, Ms. Castro, and everybody, especially to the membership of the chamber for the privilege to address you during this congressional forum. Afedei to the people of Guam, it's my extreme privilege to be here to share some of my thoughts and introduce my qualifications. It's my hope today that you walk away from this exchange of ideas and contrasting views so that we can see what this common man with an uncommon passion towards serving the island is capable of doing as your next delegate. Six months into this pandemic with no clear end in sight. In these trying times, what is clear is that Guam needs an active advocate, a diplomat someone who is willing to be an engaging force on behalf of the community in the nation's capital, a respectable representative with the character, the capacity, and the commitment, and the plan to lift us all out of this crisis into a level of human security for Guam in this era of uncertainty. Someone who has proven his real love for the island, as evidence in all things we know about the candidate, how they treat their family, how they respect their loved ones, how they work with their colleagues, and even how they dispose and deal with their enemies. 
I also believe that you can see how a candidate loves his community by how he involves himself in civic organizations to include the child's PTA. But I'm running because I bring forth an option and leadership style in the overall policy direction. I'm running because aside from having a real love for this island, I believe that my record on and off the field, so to speak, bodes well for the challenges that we must tackle facing this community during this pandemic. I bring forth experiences from public and private sectors. My principles as a Catholic gentleman and a value added dimension as a father and active member of civic organizations to the position of delegate to the House of Representatives. I served in both the executive and legislative branches as a director, uh, as a chief planner, as a teacher. I worked in the private sector in K through 12 as a director, as a planner. I've also maintained a business in technology and provided consulting to various organizations throughout the region. And yes, I am a member of the Young Men's League of Guam and the Knights of Columbus. Most important, I bring my life experiences as a father of four children, one of whom just graduated from the University of Guam, so Biba UOG and Biba to the biology majors out there. And I list these things because of the time limitations, I summarize my qualifications. But I think it's important that you, the people of Guam, those who are listening and watching this one, are able to make a determination as to who has the depth and the width of experiences, the professional maturity and the emotional intelligence to make the right decisions, to work well with others, to work hard towards accomplishing the goals set forth by the people of Guam. Last, in my service as your senator, I made it a point to carry myself with integrity, to be dynamic, to be innovative, to build bridges among and between us regardless of party lines, regardless of philosophical differences in order that we can achieve a common goal. Because I believe then as I believe now when I served the late Senator Angel Santos and under my continued mentorship under Eddie Baza Capel, that in order to best understand and discern, to empathize, to be able to lead with the consent of the government, you must be among them. You must be among them, whether you're on the side of the road in a pop-up tent or visiting working families in Swamp Road or coming up close and personal to look at an eroding shoreline in the coastal village of Fomate. That is, of course, if you attempt, you're attempting to achieve meaningful and lasting change for the people of Guam. But above all, despite the differences in philosophy or policy or even political provocations, I have always conducted myself. I've always strived to, to, to conduct myself in a manner that's consistent with our Pacific way of life, with our Chamorro way of life, with that of respect. Guahu Si William Castro. I'm the son of a customs officer and a full-time homemaker who's since passed. Malala Guzupo Delegado, I humbly ask for your vote to be Guam's next delegate to the United States House of Representatives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Castro. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our third congressional candidate, Dr. Robert Underwood. And Dr. Underwood recently served as president of the University of Guam from 2008 until July 2018. During his tenure at UOG, he established a Center for Island S Sustainability, developed GORX, making the university a global hub for information technology. He also secured EPSCOR status for the Nas National Science Foundation, ensuring the university the most substantial research grants in its history, including a new $20 million grant for marine lab research. In his career, he served as a classroom teacher, a curriculum writer, school administrator, Guam school board member, dean of college of the College of Education and academic vice president of the University of Guam. Dr. Underwood, Underwood served as Guam delegate to the US Congress from 1993 to 2003. He played an active role in the U.S. Department of Defense authorization bills, where he was an advocate for political development for insular areas and the extension of educational and social opportunities for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Dr. Underwood graduated from JFK High School in 1965. He has a doctorate in education from the University of Southern California and a BA and MA in history from Cal State University in Los Angeles. He is a distinguished national record of professional. He has a distinguished national record of professional and government achievement 
And he was appointed to the National Advisory Council on Bilingual Education by President Jimmy Carter, named to the National Board of Educational Sciences by President Barack Obama, appointed to the Board of Trustees for American Folk Life Center by Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and he received the Guam Humanities Council Lifetime Achievement Award, the Citizen of the Year Award from the National Advisory Council on Bilingual Education, and the Alumnus of the Year from Cal State Los Angeles. Members and guests, I'm pleased to welcome Congressional Candidate Dr. Robert Underwood. Half a day and good morning to you, Chairwoman Boleto, uh, President Castro, Mr. Galito, uh, my fellow candidates for this office, and members of the chamber, and all of you who are watching and listening in. COVID-19 has taken out of our hands uh, the, the capacity to plan for a future based on old assumptions. It has changed the lives of our people, created enormous job loss, and certainly a lot of uncertainty. Members of the chamber who normally make important dis economic decisions now find themselves having gut-wrenching decisions talking to loyal employees about job security and hours. We certainly need the relief that the federal government provides to all Americans, but more importantly, we need a plan going forward. And we need representation in Washington, D.C. that can articulate that plan for all of us, inside the chamber, outside the chamber, in government offices and in coffee shops, with partners in the region and with grassroots leaders in our villages. We need an economic plan that takes full advantage of our strategic importance, geographical location, standing at the US jurisdiction and the enormous energy and entrepreneurial spirit which exists here at home. Years ago, I asked the Library of Congress to prepare a map that outlines which location has the access to the most people within a five and a half hour flight. Guam beat out Honolulu. Denver, New York, and Los Angeles. We are at the edge of Asia, and this explains our position as a visitor destination and our military strategic value. But we are more than just a geographic hub for military activity. We now have 11 undersea cables with two plans. We have an institution, a maturing research institution at the University of Guam. We have the possibility of capital flight from nearby areas like Hong Kong. In fact, undersea cables, which were planned for Hong Kong and Taiwan, may even be looking for safer locations now. All of these suggest areas of entrepreneurial activities unimaginable a few years ago, but which I learned about from students and researchers at UOG and other uh, universities around the region. Understanding these possibilities and linking them to the chamber Silicon Valley uh, village, training institutions, clearing away federal hurdles, make a brighter future, not just a dream, but a plan if we have the right people and the right ideas. I understand that our existing economy is based on federal military spending and the visitor industry. And I recognize that we need to maximize local benefits from the military buildup, as well as seek uh, relief from financial burdens caused by federal policies such as compact impact migration and Medicaid and EITC policies. I know that the visitor industry needs to be revived based on distinctive immigration policies, but I also know that the future of Guam must be diversified based on those assets I just outlined and a knowledge-based economy which links research to technology to entrepreneurial skills in areas as diverse as coral reef research, undersea cables, information technology, agriculture, biosciences. To some extent, all candidates may say these things, but the decision you must make is not just who can make the case for what we want, but who can make the case for bringing us together to make a compelling case in Washington, D.C. Which one of us has a proven record of working with people, not just across the aisle and not by switching aisles. Which candidate has a real record of achievement supported by facts? A record of achievement assort, afforded, supported by facts and not just assertions. Which one has the successful experience of problem solving 
and difficult situation, who really understands the dynamics of the region and the military and federal policy making and the potential of Guam's young people in a way that allows us to plan for a future with hope and which fulfills our best aspiration to have our young people stay right here in Guam in high paying jobs that can raise a family. From my first term in the 103rd Congress and hosting the Capitol Hill Economic Conference to the constant and consistent efforts of my office in Washington, DC, and even in Manila as president of the university, I have worked consistently to bring together different ideas and perspectives to benefit the island. Always being a forceful advocate of local empowerment, both for our people and for our government. Every delegation that comes from Guam will be afforded respect, time, and dignity in Washington, DC. It is the delegate's responsibility to give you that courtesy to each one of you. Job one is to put people back to work. Job two is to allow you to share the good news of economic activities with your colleagues and your employees. Job three is for you to decide who amongst us will actually bring about job one, two. Jesus Martin, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Underwood, for that your opening remarks. Uh, next on our agenda, we're going to start asking the questions of each of the candidates and we'll wait for their answer. They have a two minute reply. And so I'm gonna ask Congressman uh, Michael San Nicholas to answer the first question. And these next questions will associated with military buildup, a vital component of Guam's economy. So the first question is, Congress is currently discussing the National Defense Authorization Act, which provides funding for military projects located right here on Guam. If you were in office today, which sections of the MDAA would you attempt to modify to make it more favorable for our island and our community? Congressman Nett San Nicholas. Thank you for the question. Uh, we are currently in office today. Uh, we have the we have the privilege, and um, we've worked to first of all ensure that the funds keep flowing. Um, that's the first priority. Um, the commitments that have been made need to constantly be reauthorized every year, and we're making sure those reauthorizations happen to the tune of 990 million dollars in this first term in office. Beyond that, we've worked very closely with the Armed Services Committee of the Guam Chamber to be able to identify what the priorities are in order for us to be able to work toward those in the NDAA. And uh, in our most recent meetings, we have, of course, identified numerous areas uh, to address, but we've also um, identified the need for us to be a little bit more strategic than we have been in how we're going about getting the um, outcomes that we're looking for. And in the most recent meeting that we had, and the most recent advocacy that we both worked on, we had uh, identified the need for us to have H2B um, uh, workers able to work on the civilian side of the fence. Um, that has been acknowledged over the years as something that's holding back our construction industry uh, pretty dramatically. It's caused the cost per square foot to almost double on our island. It's resulted in an impact on the ancillary jobs associated with construction, like heavy equipment rental and operators, uh, bookkeepers who will be responsible for the accounting of those, those equipment and the rentals, um, the ordering and the shipping, and the um, warehousing and the product sales that happen in our hardware stores. All of these ancillary industries are negatively impacted by the lack of construction, as well as our housing industry, the inventories that we have, the home prices that we have, uh, the price for rent, and the ability for our real estate uh, uh, workers to be able to generate uh, economic activity in that way. Uh, that being said, we focused our efforts on getting a huge breakthrough in the NDAA in this, this recent version, we have the amendment language in there. We got it in there with unanimous support. With unanimous support from three different committees and we're very excited about being able to see that through. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman. Next, I'd like um, Senator Will Castro to answer the question. Happy day and good morning. So if I was given the privilege to serve in the House right now at this point in time to make certain modifications to the NDAA, I think it goes without saying that you want to insert amendments like the congressman has, 
And I think that's the obligation of any congressperson to find a way around the restrictive change in policy since 2016 relative not just to H-2B visas, but to H-1 and all H visas. But I think this is a time not to restrict that conversation just to the H-2B visa situation that's emanating out of the White House. If I had the privilege to serve you, I would think this would be an opportune time to bring up issues relative to our military posture, to leverage opportunities for Guam's homeland security posture, to build a stronger regional position with our jurisdictional neighbors. I also like to insert into that conversation uh, something that would piggyback upon the exchange and commissary improvements. In addition to that, in addition to that, I think there's a case to be made that Guam should make additional investments with the assistance of the federal government in the provision of the NDAA to look at the U.S. Cyber Command mission for Guam. Last but not least, if I have the opportunity, I'd certainly want to revisit Guam's shipyard and infrastructure and optimization plan. I think this is a great time to be able to reassert ourselves as the focal point of the territory, not just the territory, but the region, for economic trade, to support military missions throughout the Pacific, and also to secure those jobs for Guam. In a nutshell, I, I can agree that it's been the commitment of every delegate to include the incumbent, to look at the H-1B, H-2B, J-1 visas in the context of the NDAA. But as the first speaker mentioned, or the last speaker, forgive me, in terms of being entrepreneurial, this would be the opportune time. These COVID circumstances require that we assert ourselves, that we think outside the box, and that we attempt a power network to bring opportunities that are not currently before the people of Guam. This is not business as usual, and if given the privilege to do so, I'd like to bring that case to the Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Castro. Next, I'll ask Dr. Underwood to answer question number one. Half a day. You know, the best way to amend the NDAA Act is to sit on the Armed Services Committee. And if I were in the Armed Services Committee, I would offer six specific ideas just off the top of my head. Of course, I would work to extend the H visa caps for Guam and the CNMI, which expire in 2023, but I would do so in a clearer fashion than even the amendment offered by the incumbent, which still sort of makes it unclear as to whether DOD or DHS is the controlling element in that decision making. But more importantly, I would have added to that to make sure that DOD and DOL work together to increase training funding for the 30,000 people that are unemployed. Every time we use uh, an opportunity to increase H2 and H1 workers, we need to increase the opportunity for local workers. I would have worked to include a provision that addresses ident increased roles for the Guam Air Army, Guam Air National Guard, including a flying mission, and also has uh, the National Guard to include it in, as a cyber unit. So, which is consistent with the national defense strategy and which is, will help uh, potential economic activities. I would have sought to ensure that the 5G pilot programs, which are established in NDAA, NDAA and being executed by DOD, include Guam. For the reasons I just mentioned, we have these undersea cables. We're sitting on the precipice of enormous IT changes here. The COVID-19 emergency has also given us a look at how fragile our healthcare system is. I would have actively worked with the Office of Economic Adjustment for that $19 million uh, new public health lab on Guam, which the governor basically almost had to work on her own to include in this, but I would have also sought more funding. And lastly, uh, we have to protect our resources. I would have asserted language to call for the monitoring of the Guam Aquifer by ongoing and anticipated military activity. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Uh, for the next question, I'm going to ask uh, Will Castro to answer this question. It's a three-part question, and it reads, do you believe that the present programmatic agreement needs to be modified? And if so, which sections would you recommend amending? And how would those changes impact the ongoing buildup? And before you start, Senator Castro, for the benefit of the audience, the programmatic agreement is among the Department of Defense, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Guam, Historic, the Guam State Historic Preservation Officer, the CNMI State Historic Preservation Officer, 
and it's regarding the military relocations to the islands of Guam and Tinian. Senator, your answer, please. Huffaday, thank you so much for the question, Ernie. Obviously, anyone who picks up the paper and is in tune with contemporary issues will find that there's there are deep problems with the programmatic agreement. We've seen that when questions relative to an indigenous species was was compromised up there uh, in Anderson Air Force Base. Uh, most recently, we're starting to see deep concerns relative to the handling of sacred remains. If I had the privilege to step forward and request that we modify the program, uh, uh, programmatic agreement, I think I'd look at two fundamental issues. Perhaps the mitigation strategy would, that would uh, in initiate an immediate halt, especially when it comes to the handling of uh, human remains. Uh, I would also like to see a fundamental change in terms of who has oversight and general supervision over the excavation, the curation, and quite hopefully the internment of these human remains to remain with the government of Guam and the SHPO office. Uh, those are the two fundamental changes to the programmatic agreement that I'd like to see happen so that these allegations of infractions upon the mishandling of artifacts and or human remains uh, can be examined more closely and fully investigated with the local government at the table. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Senator uh, Castro. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Unwood to get his views on this question. Today, the programmatic agreement is supposed to be a living and breathing document that is nearly 10 years old. It is appropriate from time to time to have the stakeholders take a look at it to see uh, that it, it reflects the original intent of this. The uncovering of the ancient Chamorro village in Magua and its destruction was a tragedy that should have been avoided and could have been avoided if we had active stakeholders representatives from the chamber, the, the activists, the environmentalists, small business owners, all sitting around the table and taking a good look at this. Current processes and procedures need to be revised in order to include more joint planning and some independent review as the rest of the uh, activity which will go on at Northwest Field and Andy South and other areas are worked on. Revising or reviewing the programmatic abu uh, agreement should not be used as a tool to stop realignment construction activities, but it should be used as a tool to prevent the destruction of Guam history, such as the site at Magua. Much of the damage may have been done in previous military construction decades ago, but the protection of these sites continues to remain a DOD responsibility. Environmental regulations, the application of the Endangered Species Act, and the preservation of cultural areas do not exist to frustrate military activities. They exist to balance our values as a society. I have seen these at work at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. The people of Guam deserve the same kind of treatment that their fellow Americans get in North Carolina and Hawaii when it comes to protecting their environment, and their cultural resources and their history. This is the purpose of the programmatic agreement and we should continually review it in order to refine it and make sure it remains true uh, to its original purpose. Thank you very much, Dr. Underwood. Next, I'd like to call on Congressman San Nicholas to give his views on this question. Thank you, Ernie, for the question. <clears throat> I think it's important to open and clarify that to date there has been no violations of the programmatic agreement. I repeat, there's been no violations of the programmatic agreement. If there were, the local government would have recourse to be able to take the federal government to court and file the necessary injunctions and actions in order to halt or change course or require a review of the alleged violations of the programmatic agreement. So we need to clarify that because while the program programmatic agreement may have been in place for the last 10 years, the, re the reality is that the buildup's progress has been slowed over all those years as well. But what we have seen since the buildup has initiated is that the program programmatic agreement has served its purpose. And we see that when we have the local government being able to speak up and call to account the federal government and the military and the construction project that are ongoing up there on the base. The recent discovery of the remains uh, during the uh, buildup construction is a classic example of how the programmatic agreement is working because when those remains were discovered, the necessary triggers initiated 
the right actions were taken. And I have to credit the Admiral himself, who I called personally, and who assured me that we're going to be addressing these remains um, even before they've identified and confirmed that they were um, ancient remains, they're still treating them as if they are in order to ensure they're taking maximum precautions. So as of right now, I'm not, I'm not too keen on pushing changes to the programmatic agreement. It so far is working. There have been no violations. And as long as we're being good partners at the table, and it's most especially as long as the military is being good partners at the table, I look forward to continuing the work of all parties to ensure the programmatic agreement is upheld and that the proper respect is afforded to our cultural sites while we also move forward the very necessary and long delayed military buildup. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, on this next question, again, it refers to the um, programmatic agreement. I'm gonna ask Dr. Underwood to answer this question. Do you support the present data collection process for the preservation of historical artifacts? If not, what methodology would you support and would this recommendation create further delays for the ongoing buildup? Dr. Underwood? Okay, uh, I generally support the data collection process. However, I want to point out that the process of collecting and uh, preserving historical artifacts should not be misunderstood simply as objects, but belonging to people, but also they include the remains of human beings as well as artifacts which are serve as evidence of the complexity of life here on Guam, people that we are connected to. They are important items in the string of history, which gives meaning to who we are today. We need to make sure that the data collection processes and the data collectors understand this fact. If this is accepted and honored, I believe this process is, can be done without a significant delay of buildup. And that has to be, uh, predicated on continual communication, uh, which seemed to be lacking in the case of the Magua. Let's be real. The Magua destruction was uh, not, maybe not a technical breach of the programmatic agreement, but the Magua destruction was something that could have been avoided. These rules do not exist to inconvenient construction, but to ensure that the past is put into proper perspective. The Office of Economic Adjustment, with whom I've worked with for many years, has proposed building a cultural repository facility at UOG, which will be the home to these artifacts. The plans are excellent, but they need to be augmented with resources for staffing and maintenance of the artifacts for study and display. I will work to make sure that the innovative solutions to make sure this facility is adequately staffed for the long run. Hey, you know what? That's another idea for the NDAA, which you can do if you're sitting inside the Armed Services Committee. Additionally, I support the creation of using federal resources uh, to seconds. create a heat map. A heat map will help developers understand where environmental hotspots are and cultural hotspots are before they engage in construction. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Next, I'd like to ask Congressman San Nicholas to give his view, his viewpoints on this question. Uh, similar to my response in the programmatic agreement with respect to um, data collection and preservation, uh, again, I feel like the um, actions so far have been uh, pretty substantial, particularly when you compare them to our local, to what we have to compare locally. Um, we have enormous federal resources being deployed uh, for the purposes of collect data collection and preservation just on the military build-up site project alone. I mean, for, for reference, Ernie, and, and to be real, when we have projects throughout the island, we have nowhere near this level of archaeological and um, uh, uh, heritage and historical expertise supporting or looking out for those kinds of, uh, those kinds of issues. We have our Guam resources, but in this military build-up, we have our Guam resources who are being watchdogs over the federal resources. So the collection and preservation activities so far, which were part of the initial understandings that were determined when we initiated this uh, uh, military build-up project, I believe are so far working. And I believe that as these sites are uncovered, the proper triggers are being initiated as we have agreed to, and the proper oversight is being conducted to include our local government. Um, we can always, you know, we can always promise that we're gonna go into the NDAA and we're gonna add things to it in order to augment what's out there. 
But the reality is that we already have things that are in place and we can only ask for so much when we're going to the table and trying to secure resources for military projects. Um, securing $990 million in, in continued funding is already a big accomplishment. Securing an H2B uh, amendment to be able to address that issue is an accomplishment that my, my previous incumbent, um, the, the, my primary, my predecessor, who had 16 years of seniority wasn't able to do. Um, we need to be um, understanding of the fact that while we want to continue to pursue other avenues, we need to be also upfront that about the fact that we aren't going to be able to deliver on everything that we're promising just because we're saying it in a forum. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Senator Castro, please give us your viewpoint on this important question. Hafidi, my prior response is the same, that I really believe that the current process of the Department of Defense conducting the archaeolo archaeological work and data collection, especially with the handling of human remains, should shift to the local authorities. I'd like to see an improved process in the handling of human remains, once that's more, one that is much more collaborative in nature perhaps with the direct supervision of the SHPO. I'd like to see personally, and it's not a matter of science. I don't think it's as simple as an infraction and going through the checklist of one, two, three, A, B, and C. I think the handling of human remains based on my value system is something that needs to be closely tied to how we view ourselves and our ancestors, how we value the identity of this great Chamorro nation. I really believe that in, when it's placed into the hands of those who care the most about the most of us as Chamorros, that we'll see that these remains and artifacts are properly handled and not put in a cardboard box and put in some historic area in terms of an air conditioned facility. My culture and my heritage means that much more to me. I think we just need to look to the North and see how they place tremendous value on the internment of human remains. And for me, that says a lot in terms of who I am as a member of this community. So again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it needs to shift from the data collection to the handling of ancient remains, from the Department of Defense to the direct supervision of the people of Guam vis-a-vis -vis the government of Guam and the SHPO. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator San Nicolas. And I'd just like to uh, welcome anybody who's come to join us on the Congressional Forum. Uh, if you missed the opening remarks and also you're now just joining us, uh, you're watching us live. Uh, via GoToWebinar, and this is the Guam Chamber of Commerce Congressional Forum, and our invited guests are uh, U.S. Congressman Michael San Nicholas, uh, Dr. Robert Underwood, and Senator Will Castro. And next, we're going to ask a question a little bit more uh, tuned in to the military buildup again, outside of the program management agreement. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Congressman San Nicholas to answer this next question. And the question posed is, do you support the continuation of H2B and H1B visa cat exemption for Guam and the CNMI? And if elected, would you champion the extensions? If not, how would you address the skilled labor shortages that our island presently faces? Congressman. Thank you, Ernie. I think in, um, in our opening statement and uh, maybe in one other instance throughout this forum, I've already um, uh, indicated that we don't—we not only support uh, enhancing the H2B uh, access, but we are actually taking action on it. Um, as far as the cap and its expiration, of course, we, we're, we're definitely going to be interested in extending that, and we'll address that when its time uh, comes due. Um, and between now and then, of course, we need to make sure the H2B visas are extended onto the civilian side of the fence. Um, that being said, I, I think that we've kind of belabored, belabored the point, uh, at least with respect to where I stand on that. I really believe that um, we need to stand up our construction industry. We need to have ancillary, ancillary industries that are dependent on that industry to be able to stand up as well. We need our real estate market to be able to benefit from what the outcomes will be if we're able to access, uh, reaccess that resource. And um, it's going to be good for Guam. You know, um, I really think that as much as we want to create local jobs, um, that's one area that's had been an opportunity for years, um, but we have not developed the local workforce for it. So we've got to make sure that we're not uh, having that roadblock in place any further, getting H2Bs outside for the civilian projects, and of course, extending the cap. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Senator Will Castro, uh, please give us your viewpoint on uh, this question on H2B and H1B visa cap. Sure. The question is, do I support the continuation of the exemptions for Guam for H2B, H1B? Yeah, to be absolutely clear, I think everyone knows that the caps have had a deleterious effect upon the economy. 
We've seen that how it, we have seen firsthand how it has contributed to the skyrocketing costs associated with construction and home ownership. We've also seen how it's affected tourism industries. We've seen how it affects skilled labor positions even at the local private hospital. Of course, I agree to support the exemptions. I think the case needs to be made, whoever's in Congress, that Guam is a geographically disparate area, that we're in fact very separate. We don't have access to the same labor pools. We have to make the case that we need this skilled labor from wherever it's gonna come from. But that shouldn't stop us from working with the University of Guam and the new School of Engineering that's coming up to continue the power network with the Guam Trades Academy to utilize the local population and workforce so that they can transition into these positions. But until then, we're experiencing as a territory unprecedented military construction in the region and on the territory in particular. So until we have the critical mass of skilled labor, there's no way around it. If we want people to be able to afford their next home, we certainly have to petition and advocate, advocate, advocate for continued exception to H visas and all other associated skilled visas. I don't only support that exemption for Department of Defense construction activity behind the fence, I certainly think it should be a blanket exception for all skilled labor positions outside of the fence. I think that we can do this in collaboration with the chamber, our partners from the other jurisdictions who can make the same case. I think we can leverage our build-up position based on spatial economics and location. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, Dr. Underwood, please give us your viewpoint on this question. Uh, yes, of course, uh, we should uh, continue the uh, cap exemption even when it comes up, but this affords us another opportunity to consider what should we be doing in addition to lifting the cap. And I believe very strongly that there's two things we can do. One, this points up the fact that we are in a unique situation along with the Northern Marianas and suggests in keeping with the original passage of the 2008 Consolidated Natural Resources Act, that there be consideration to a kind of a unique immigration zone for Guam and the Northern Marianas. We should work together in order to be able to manage labor better, in order to be able to uh, access skilled labor better, in order to manage our visitor industry. We're a unique part of America and we're a distant part of America. So in addition to work, lifting the cap, we should work on a proactive solution. The other thing is that we have to uh, couple all of these caps to uh, uh, responding to labor needs, have to be coupled to support for local labor. Every dollar that we spend on foreign workers must be matched by significant DOL uh, funds and fees to train local workers and give them the jobs they need. We have 30,000 people who are unemployed right now, maybe more seeking some kind of unemployment benefit. We need to make an earnest effort to train these people. We need to make sure just the, the health crisis has indicated that there's thousands of people needed in healthcare industry on Guam. So all of these things suggest that we shouldn't look at this lifting of the cap in isolation. Of course, we should lift it. Of course, we should get on with construction, but we have to tie it to our economic future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. This next question, I'm gonna ask uh, Senator Castro to answer it first. And we pose, while the Guam Chamber of Commerce supports economic diversification, tourism remains the essential pillar of our community and our lifeline for all of our small businesses. We have seen ramifications from the CDC, Center for Disease <laughs> Control, in its categorization of Guam as a foreign destination. So this is a two-part question. How would you ensure that our issues and our status are apparent in DC to benefit tourism? And what moves would you make to guarantee a pool of labor for our island? First of all, I think the designation by the CDC, we've seen that uh, it's, a, it's a travesty. It speaks to the ignorance of certain federal officials. I'm glad the governor was able to clarify that and increase their awareness of who we are as a Pacific territory. Uh, I wanna approach this question with, from three prongs. First, from the most immediate, federal relief packages. 
I really believe that we need to advocate that more money goes into the hands of businesses and to the common person and less into the central government. Second to that, Ernie, I think we need to harden the pillars of this economy. I think we need to take full advantage of our advocacy to uh, alleviate some of the caps and the restrictions that have been besetting us in terms of the H visas and other restrictions that affect our local industry since 2016. In addition to that, economic diversification, in my humble opinion, should include things that are strategic commodities, things that speak to issues of food sovereignty and production, to be able to serve a strategic role, not just for the military in terms of positioning of its arms, but in terms of supplying food, not just for the military, but for all of the region. I really think there's an opportunity to develop, as one of the speakers mentioned, this knowledge-based economy. But for me, for me in areas of high technology, cyber terrorism, drone preparation, the skilled workforces in the medical sciences. These are the ways I think we can shore up and, and diversify the economy. I'd like to look at things like cyber tech and space technology that's come here that's knocking on our doorstep. So in a nutshell, with the 30 seconds remaining to recap again, look at it from three ways. The immediate relief packages coming in from either the White House or the Congress to also shore up the pillars of the economy and address over those repressive policies that are besetting this economy. And to look at strategic, strategic commodities that we could take advantage of so we can achieve a level of human security for this specific territory. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Castro. Uh, next, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Underwood. Uh, please give us your comments on this question. Thank you again for this opportunity. You know, we have to tell the Guam story consistently and push back about against general ignorance about Guam. That's all of our responsibility. But it is up to the delegate to consistently tell the Guam story and to say its needs, how we came under the U.S. flag and what Guam means to the country. This is what I mean about emphasizing our strategic assets. We're not asking for a handout. We're asking for a fair hand in policy that is equal to our value to the country, which in this part of the world is immeasurable. In keeping with the 2008 uh, uh, Consolidated Natural Resource Act, which I mentioned earlier, the governor has the right to petition DHS and ask for additional countries to the Guam CNMI visa waiver program. I would work with the governor and with the CNMI to uh, explore that possibility with Vietnam, Malaysia, and other Asian countries. But as I stated earlier, we need to find a joint solution to the migration of people. And the best hope for that, I believe, relies on establishing the special immigration zone, which is there, which was the pattern was uh, uh, suggested about 10 years ago. We're not part, we're, we are part of the U.S., but we are far away from the U.S. mainland. We should be allowed to take advantage of our unique location and strength, not just for military purposes, but for economic purposes and for our own sustainability as an island society. We would be a more favorable area for foreign investment and the placement of facilities which need the protection and security of U.S. law. It could even have implications for transportation and air route flexibility. I will even work with GBB to see if existing COVID stimulus funding could be used to supplement local funding to help expand our tourism and destination brand to other locations. The problem of labor is tied Watch. not just to bringing it in, but it is also tied to helping those that are unemployed find jobs. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. And next, I'd like to call on um... Congressman San Nicholas, and my apologies, Congressman, I misidentified you in that last question, so my apologies. But uh, please give us your viewpoint. Actually, I think it was uh, uh, Senator Castro who you you misidentified, and uh, uh, we're we're all good with that. I know I know Will and I are are, are easy picking, so <laughs> no worries there, Ernie. But um, you know um, to, to answer your first question about uh, the CDC issue, you know the CDC has been around since 1946. That's very, very important to have in, in perspective of the question, because that error that they made in reference to Guam isn't an error that was uh, as a result of something that happened in the last year or nine months. That's an error of the fact that Guam has not done enough to be able to get front of, my, front of mind of these agencies that have been around way before I've been born, way before I think everybody's been born. <laughs> and so, you know, in 1946, the CDC was established, and that, that speaks to the lack of Guam getting out there the lack of Guam getting on the map. And that's why we did things differently this term. That's why we took the Financial Services Committee. 
so we can get on that committee and speak to national issues and get national attention for Guam on things that all Americans are concerned about. Not just the narrow issues that, of course, Guam is interested in with the military or with the Natural Resources Committee, but speaking on things like making sure that we have the right oversight of the Treasury or the Federal Reserve, making sure that um, companies are being accountable to shareholders. And with Guam speaking to those big issues, that's what gets Guam noticed. That's what gets Guam put on the map. And aside from just telling the Guam story, we need to have Guam be an active participant in the national discourse. And that's what we've done. And that's something that I'm very, very happy that we did because it's also put us in line to be able to be involved in the conversation of all the other build up, I'm sorry, all of the other relief packages that we were able to get through. The second question that you asked is with respect to the labor pool. And I believe that uh, we, we will always have access to labor. I think what we need to really be asking is how do we create more jobs? You know, we need to diversify our economy and we're looking at doing that with our work on the XM Bank, trying to create export oriented industries for our island. So that our people who can, our people will be able to de decide what industries they want to go work in and we can create high paying jobs for our people so that we can attract more people to come home from the states and take on those jobs that we have set up in all of our industries. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, call on Dr. Underwood to answer this next question. And we may have discussed about this in previous Q&A, but now this is your chance, as well as the other candidates, to give us more, specific, uh, more specifics. And our question posed to you is, um, our economy is obviously in trouble. Other than the military buildup, if elected, what actions would you take to help diversify our economy, both for the short term and in for the long run? I have argued in numerous venues that we need a knowledge-based economy for diversification. Knowledge economy is based upon the quantity, quality, and accessibility of information more than just the means of production. Young entrepreneurs know this, and based on research and coral reefs, biosciences, aquaculture, IT, almost any field combined with the information infrastructure in Guam offers a huge array of opportunities for high-tech jobs. And the transfer of research into economic activities. UOG just won a $20 million research grant, which itself is supposed to contribute to economic growth. Included in this vision is building our digital economy based on our information technology. Guam stands at the crossroads of significant fiber optic cables that are barely tapped for use in Guam. Combined with the growing challenges of doing business in China and questions about security in China, along with the ongoing instability in Hong Kong, is an opportunity for Guam to position itself as a digital hub in Asia. Based on the existing 11 cables, two plan ones, and perhaps others directed here because of the insecurity I would work and reach out to companies like Google and Microsoft and others and partner them with local officials to explore possibilities of setting up data centers. We could become the data super hub of the Pacific because of our geography, the assets I talked about, our geography and the security provided by US law. Further, I would leverage this unique opportunity as a way uh, by inviting DOD to put in their 5G pilot program here in Guam. We have a unique opportunity to capitalize on the situation and develop this third leg, high tech, information laden, uh, knowledge driven economy that takes advantage of our young people. We also need to take a look at our medical services and our medical Thank infrastructure. You, and provide those Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Congressman San Nicolas. Can you give us more specifics on this question? Thank you for the question, Ernie. We can talk about diversifying our economy all we want. We've been doing that for my entire life. I remember growing up and hearing the discussion about diversifying, diversifying, diversifying. We need tangibles. We need tangibles and we need to start getting it done. And that's exactly what we've been delivering over the last year and nine months. Our bill for native contracting will allow for our local contractors to be able to avail of $30 billion more in federal contracts throughout the United States, bringing those federal dollars into Guam. 
our bill for national heritage area designations that will allow for our sites, uh, World War II sites, our cultural sites, even our natural sites to become eligible for federal dollars will not only bring in the federal money to support those sites, but it will also upgrade them and upkeep them for our visitors to be able to come, respect, and enjoy. Beyond those two areas, we've also had tangibles of the Export-Import Bank. We've had our first XM outreach to Guam, and they've been around since 1936. These companies provide financing support for Guam businesses to be able to find U.S.-made products and ship them out into Asia, taking advantage of what our historical role was as a trading hub going all the way back to ancient times. And lastly, you know, we also have the financial services industry opportunities, and we've been doing a, a lot of work working with SIFMA, the um, Securities uh, Financial Management Group, to be able to uh, reach out to these companies that are being affected by Hong Kong and other areas and look at Guam and, and reconsider Guam, because to bring financial industries here would require very little infrastructure investment from what we already have on the ground. So we need tangibles, we're working on those tangibles, let's stop talking about diversifying and let's keep the work going to get the diversification done. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Senator Castro, please give us your viewpoint and specifics on this question. This is always an exciting topic and thank you for giving the opportunity to expound. You know, I. To get to it, I think the greatest potential rests in our ability to gain strategic partnerships and advantages with our northern neighbors. There's a lot of good going on here, but let me start with our domestic front. You got good things going on with like the Lim Tiaco family and producing those strategic commodities to feed not just the military, but the entire island. Uh, but I'd like to stretch your mind for a minute. Couldn't we rest control and have greater jurisdiction and, and self-governance over things like our maritime resources? Could we get around the Commerce Clause and other restrictive federal policies to partner, as my other colleague had mentioned here, partner with the CNM? I've been working on this One Marianas Initiative for the greater part of eight years. Couldn't we develop a viable fisheries industry? Couldn't we develop tax and tariff-free trade between us and the jurisdiction to the north of us so that we have strategic commodities, lemmai from the north, sweet corn from Wuhan, so that we can leverage the ability to produce these crops for the sake of food security, for the sake of nutritional, nutritious consumption, for jobs on Guam and throughout the Marianas. And then when we get to that, perhaps we can push the envelope to arrest jurisdiction over those resources in our waters, things that lead to scientific discoveries. Couldn't we treat the distance between us and the neighboring territory, Commonwealth to be exact, as a sea lane so that we can trade not just uh, between jurisdictions, but construe that under federal, federal policy or rule of law, or even just the rule of application as delineated by the White House, that that is in fact a lane that's free of tax and tariff-free trade because we're considered for the purposes of economic prosperity and self-sustainability as a sea lane within the state. There's so much else going on in here that I like to capitalize upon, but I think that's the key. The key to economic diversification is to lift those rep repressive policies that currently govern us, that currently govern trade in the territory, that currently govern how far out from the reef we have jurisdiction. I think if we had full control yeah. over the EEC, that in fact we could see so much more on the return of investment for this great Chamorro nation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, I'd like to call on uh, Congressman San Nicolas. And the next, the question we pose to you is going to be issues such as the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, and the COFA, or the Compact of Free Association amongst the U.S. and Federal States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. This agreement continues to place a drain on our government's finances. If in office, how would you address these issues to lessen the adverse impact they bring towards our government's coffers? Congressman? Thank you for the question, Ernie. I guess I'll tackle the compact impact issue first. Um, the, the initial problem right now for a compact impact situation is that the reimbursement amounts that we are getting is grossly insufficient to our actual costs. Um, it comes out to about $819 per migrant, when our cost for healthcare is almost $3,000, our cost to educate is almost $9,000, and our cost on EITC on a per citizen basis for that migrant is about $2,800. So we need to change the reimbursement formula. Um, that's been a problem that isn't, didn't just materialize again in the last year or nine months. That's been a problem for decades. 
And so we need to address that issue. And the opportunity is here for us to be able to do that with the implementation agreements currently being negotiated. In those implementation agreements, we've advocated for Guam issues on no less than five occurrences in the last year and a half. We've met with the ambassadors, we've met with the negotiators, we've met with, uh, we've spoken up in the Natural Resources Committee and in the Senate, all about trying to make sure that the compact for free association is not going to be insufficient, not only for the needs of the people of Guam, but also for the needs of our brothers and sisters who live in our neighboring islands. So we're definitely working on addressing the, uh, the uh, reimbursement costs. We're working on making sure that Medicaid um, costs for the migrants are also being covered. We lost that in 1996. We're co-sponsoring a bill now with one of our colleagues to be able to get that on. So that's being handled in the compact impact. As far as EITC that I mentioned earlier, we've had about I think five bills, was it, that we've gotten the language in already to get a 75% reimbursement. That language has passed the House, so we have pretty firm House commitment on that. We're going to continue following through on that commitment until we're able to get a breakthrough. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, next, I'd like to ask um, Senator Castro, uh, please give us your viewpoints on these two important issues. Well, first of all, those two issues are indicative of a much bigger problem that faces the territory. We're seeing federal mandates and federal repressive policies at one hand, on one hand, they negotiate on behalf of the people of Guam when we're part of the American family. But on the other hand, when it comes time to appropriate uh, recompense in terms of the impact upon the community, it's left to the local coffer to absorb that. This issue with the Compact of Free Association is a perennial one to the tune of $100 million in liabilities every year. I think the administration now and in the past has done a fine job in being able to articulate that to the best of our ability. Only recently, only recently has the federal government awarded an amount to be able to articulate a reporting mechanism that may be acceptable for due consideration for financial compensation associated with the compact. Both the COPA and the EITC are addressed at different levels. The COPA at the international level between two sovereign nations, the United States and unfortunately not us, but as represented by the United States and with all the participating freely associated states. I think the number one issue we can do, whoever is elected, is to show up at the table, to take notes, to be an advocate, to petition, to tell our story about what it is and the kind of impact it's having upon our infrastructure. GMH is a small example, one example of that equation, to the tune of anywhere from 18 to $30 million in uninsured or underinsured services provided to that demographic. In addition to that, EITC is just another conversation that's very similar in terms of a financial liability that extends certain privileges to a demographic in this community, and rightfully so. They deserve it. However, when it's left up to the local government to address that issue, we're left high and dry. Similarly with war claims, I support 1365 and Bill 181. I was one of the largest advocates, but again, we were left to pick up the tab and pay for that compensation ourselves. I think this is a time to send someone who's going to stand forward and advocate for a permanent solution and not have to petition time after time again for an amendment to the NDAA or special consideration on a seasonal basis for a final solution to address these age-old issues facing the people of Guam. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Castro. Uh, next, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Underwood. Uh, please give us your comments on these two issues. Okay, very well. Well, the first issue is really how would, uh, what actions or approaches I would take uh, to present our message in Washington, D.C. Well, first of all, I want to assure you, the uh, Guam Contractors Association, the Women's Chamber of Commerce, that my approach would be collaborative. I will try to seek input on a regular basis to make sure that we are presenting one voice in Washington. In specific terms, this requires a specific legislative strategy. In the legislative strategy, we could have had an amendment to the State Department reauthorization that carved out a role, maybe large, maybe small, for Guam to participate in the COFA renegotiations. Secondly, we cannot allow the agreements to go forward without having a Guam-specific package attached to it. And so I have proposed a $100 million compact impact package, uh, which is way over the $30 million currently. And I would make, make sure that that be attached to the approval of the compact agreement. I would also make COFA migrants and maybe even COFA residents eligible for Medicare so that our medically indigent program here at home is made whole and maybe they won't migrate here just to get healthcare. 
It has been hard to seek these fixes in Congress, but the renegotiation of the COFA provides us an opportunity to correct this injustice. We need a specific legislative strategy. The payment of EITC is also connected to COFA migrants, although lagging wages across the board has created this ballooning of EITC payments over 500% in this century. As you know, we're a mirror tax code, but we certainly should argue, as has Delegate Plaskett, as has Delegate Sablon, for 100% reimbursement. Five seconds. Not 75%, 100%. I will spare no effort to do exactly that. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. And again, for anyone who's just now joining us, uh, you are tuned in to the Guam Chamber of Commerce Congressional Forum, presented to you live on GoToWebinar. And our invited guests are Congressman Michael San Nicholas, Senator Will Castro, and Dr. Robert Underwood. Uh, for this final question, I'm um, going to call upon Will Castro and the question that we pose on this last question of the day is, if elected, what will be the priority issue you will champion for Guam in the United States House of Representatives? Senator DeCastro. Well, thank you. I, I think there's an issue that's been adopted by the territory that we see that, in my opinion, is um, hasn't been closed out fully. I'd like to revisit the war claims and address the, the deadlines that have been passed. I'd like to address the funding source. I also like to look at the compensation to the net present value of what's due to each of the war claim survivors and or their dependents. Second, I think it's 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 time to address the issues of veterans affairs, specifically veterans health care on Guam. If elected, I'd like to be given the tremendous privilege to network not just with ourselves because we've been seeing what the historical opportunities have been and have been facing the veterans community, but perhaps to work with our northern neighbors to come at a partnership approach to establishing a regional veterans medical facility in partnership with the active military here, right up here at Naval Hospital. Those are the two things I hope, if I'm given the privilege to address as my standing priority that's been articulated by the government of Guam. Of course, I have personal preferences in terms of policy directions and developing certain industries. Of course, there are other things that I like to address as part of my personal political platform. But I really believe that the sole advocate to represent the territory should carry forward the sentiments of the people of Guam as articulated either in the plans or public law and in direct communication with the heads of government. Those are the two longstanding perennial issues that we need closure on, war claims and veterans affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Castro. Next, I'd like to call on Dr. Underwood to uh, answer this final question. Um, thank you for the opportunity again, uh, Ernie. Almost all issues are equally important, whether seeking relief from federal regulations and mandates, the inclusion of, pe of our people in programs now close to us, or the extension of healthcare to the most vulnerable and educational opportunities for all. But until public, after public health conditions return, return to a near normal, the most important matter is to pay attention to our homeland's economic recovery. Economic recovery can only come through the creation of new jobs and new industries. Diversification, I'm sad to say, diversification. If people are not working and earning an income, most other dimensions of our lives diminish equally. There will be federal support for jobs in yet a third recovery package, which will certainly be developed in the next Congress and will give us this opportunity to put people back to work. But I will also urge in that package money given to entrepreneurs to invest in new industries. And uh, we're taking full advantage uh, for our workforce and for our contractors uh, for the military buildup. The visitor industry will recover, but not as quickly, and will take significant federal partnership through Im immigration initiatives and the promotion of safe air routes to and from Guam, as I outlined, it or outlined earlier. Before the pandemic, we needed economic diversification. Uh, we need it now more than ever. A new knowledge-based economy, a new circular economy, helps us create opportunities for jobs that take us to new levels of success. The next economic recovery package must not just create jobs, but give companies and entrepreneurs opportunities to secure needed funds to build businesses 
that build on our sustainable uh, strengths. A major opportunity still awaits us in our understanding as the crossroads of the Pacific, not just as the military used to say, but as the home for undersea cables, for high-tech opportunities in creating data centers and a potential data hub protected by US law here on Guam while we sit on the edge of Asia. Our positioning could not be better, but it will take local commitment, clearing away any federal impediments and finding ways for investors to see us as a natural place to do business. We're Thank obviously you, adept Sorry. at conveying messages in addition to the 5G DOD program and the cyber structure that could be placed in the National Guard, we are poised for a significant economic recovery. Thank you, Dr. Underwood, for your comments. Uh, now for the final question and uh, final respondent, please call on um, Congressman San Nicholas. <clears throat> Thank you, Ernie. You know, when you ask for just one answer, you know you're not going to get just one answer when you have people who are running for office uh, trying to uh, make sure that we touch on everything. The, the number one thing, the, the reason why, I mean, one of the biggest reasons why I ran for Congress, and I want to definitely keep working on it, is supplemental security income for our people. Um, that's something that's just incredibly near and dear to my heart uh, with my boy. And uh, it's something that, you know, as long as I'm in this office and as long as that's not accomplished, I'm just going to have to keep pushing for that. Um, that's that's absolutely a huge priority issue for me. Our, we have so many um, people who would be able to benefit from that. Um, it's something that we can, I think, achieve, uh, especially with the uh, current progress in the courts speaking towards that. So if I can close that off, I mean, that would just be really, really special on a personal level for me. Um, but on the, in addition to that, um, one of the things that we also want to make sure we follow through on is um, HR 1713 that we're working on to, uh, to acknowledge the fact that there was Agent Orange, or at the very least, dioxin used on our military bases. That not only made those veterans that were exposed to it sick, but it made every veteran that came home and drank from our, that same water lens, it made them sick. It made so many of our families who um, drank that water, it made them sick. And we need to take a long and hard uh, process necessary for us to not only get the federal government to acknowledge that, but to do so in a strategic way so that we can get that domino effect in place where 1713 will acknowledge it for our veterans and that domino will continue following so that it gets all the way to acknowledging that impact to our people. I think those are two, two very, um, very special areas that I would like to continue working on. And, uh, you know, I, I really would like the opportunity to get that done. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank the candidates today for taking the time to prepare and participate in today's Congressional Candidate Forum sponsored by the Guam Chamber of Commerce. We hope today's forum gave you some insight to each candidate's dedication, preparation, qualifications, and passion to represent Guam and all of us in the 117th House of Representatives and in the administration. On behalf of the Guam Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Directors, its management and staff, we thank you all for being with us today. We wish you all good health and keep up the vigilance against the pandemic COVID-19. So this is and good day. Hafidi, um, Ernie, we just are allowing the, uh, the candidates to provide their concluding remarks, sir. Okay, uh, so we will ask closing remarks for um, Senator Will Castro. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you so much to the chamber for putting together this forum to allow for the exchange of ideas and, and reactions to certain questions you had. Um, it's my hope also that the exchange was fruitful and beneficial. It's my hope that the people like Guam are able to see the level of energy and the commitment, the thoughts and the differences in leadership style and overall policy. Uh, that we're able to demonstrate if we're dynamic and capable of articulating our thoughts, capable of demonstrating that we can be representative and respectful, capable of building bridges and putting in the time and effort to represent Guam well in the nation's capital. You know, I hope I've demonstrated that I'm capable of both being the statesman and the fighter, giving one, whether it's in Chamorro or in English, and um, issues that are important that provoke me in terms of uh, when the, the, the voices of the minorities are treaded upon. 
You see, everything we talked about, all 12 questions, for me at least, can be reduced to three things. Securing greater rights and access and opportunities for Guam. To build strong regional partnerships, partnerships with the federal government, partnerships with local leaders, and to bring a unified message, a unified Guam message to the nation's capital in order that we can achieve a level of human security in this era of uncertainty. I'd like to close and share the wisdom from Guam's first appointed Chamorro governor when he said, and I quote, from this time on, the eyes of the nation will be upon us, watching and probing step by step to evaluate our integrity and our ability to discharge of those responsibilities which are inherent in self-government. And so with that said, I humbly petition for your vote for delegate and hope that you can make the best possible long-term investment for the territory. I don't come from tremendous personal wealth and I certainly don't come from long history of political legacy. I'm hoping that in this brief exchange, I brought one thing to you, authenticity. We can debate the nuances of public policy. We can even compromise on one or two things in terms of our platform. But for the land and for the people, I'm hoping that you'll be able to make a wise selection this this election, whether it's the primary or the general. Wahu si William Kushkin, Malalagudu Pudelagado, Mats Malago, Nabisepi Hamji Pudelagado, Kilado. My name is Will Castro. Thank you so much for the privilege to the chamber and for the people for listening. God bless you. God bless Guam. And God bless the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Castro. Uh, next, I'll call upon uh, Dr. Underwood to give his closing two minute remarks. And thank you, and I thank my fellow candidates for their participation in this. In my opening statement, I stated that we had three jobs. The third job is for you to make the choice between those you have heard today and how they answered your question. It is tempting to say that you should select the candidate that agrees with you the most. But how would you know whether the candidate is simply telling you what you want to hear? It's also tempting to say that you should select the candidate who was the most articulate or smooth or even confident. Well, I'd like to think that I was that candidate, but not everyone will make the same assessment. Sometimes candidates have great days and off days, just like most people. But here is something you need to consider. Job three, which I asked you to consider, really is an assessment about who do you trust with the island's future in Washington, D.C. Which one of the candidates today based on their answer, their understanding of the issues, provided you with the confidence that you can work with them, even if you don't always perfectly agree with them. Which one of the candidates can build a Guam consensus rather than a one-person consensus on what needs to happen in Washington, D.C.? We have one voice in Washington, D.C. That voice must be trustworthy, meaning that the voice is worthy of your trust, that it will not be violated, that there will always be consultation and communication, that it has the wisdom and the experience to give the people of Guam the kind of representation that they deserve. I make a commitment to be that voice and provide that kind of public service. I humbly ask for your vote of confidence in the upcoming election. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. And next, I'd like to call on Congressman Michael San Nicholas to give his closing two minute remarks. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you so much for the uh, the job of uh, having to moderate us. I think that we were very engaged. I think the Chamber of Commerce for putting this together is very beneficial, not only for um, the Chamber and for the public, but also for the candidates. I think that my challengers shared some very good ideas I would be very interested in working with them on to be able to further explore our work, our campaign, our candidacy, what it means for us to be in Congress is results and what's tangible. It's always been a, a hallmark of the work that I've done. We need to make sure that what we say to the people is what we're going to be able to deliver for them, that we're not making any empty promises, and that the work that we do is generating actual results, actual tangibles that we can measure and understand and look towards in order to make sure that we're progressing the way that we said we would when we make our campaign promises to you. If you go back to every single one of my campaigns from when I ran for Congress to when I ran for Senator, you will find a direct correlation between what I say and what we do. 
And that's what we're doing for you in the Congress. We're not getting involved in any of the rhetoric. We're not making any empty promises. We're going to call it like it is. And we're going to work towards delivering for the people of Guam. That's the kind of service that I've always committed myself to. It's a kind of service that we are continuing to commit ourselves to. And I would love to continue working for you as your congressman if you will so have us. Thank you and see you as Thank you, Congressman San Nicolas. And again, everyone, thank you for joining us on the Guam Chamber of Commerce Congressional Forum. And this was brought to you by the sponsors of Docomo Pacific, Bank of Hawaii, First Hawaiian Bank, and Triple J Enterprises. And again, we wish everybody a good day. And please keep safe and let's keep vigilant against COVID-19. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Adios.